is the last class, I guess, for today, or you have uh, tutorials after 130 onwards? No tutorials. OK. Anyway, let's start with the topic and see how many join. So is screen visible and I'm audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great. Yes, sir. Yeah, th thank you. So this is basically the last topic of the present one, which is the complex analysis. In fact, this topic on its own is not even necessarily connected with the uh, complex analysis. But we can see that in certain cases, the complex analysis can be useful for evaluating certain integrals. So uh, actually this class or this topic is broadly called as the integral transform. So as the word says transform, we are talking about the transformation. So we will of course be transforming our functions. And when we will be transforming our functions, so integral operator you may think about or integral operation, we will take as the transformation operation. So there are class of uh, transformations actually, or the class of integral transformations which are useful. Now, in some sense, this topic is basically the extension of Fourier series. So uh, what was Fourier series? Can somebody just tell me? Uh, the concept? Expansion so we used to in expand terms up. of science and cosines. So expansion yes. of a? Any, a? A periodic function in terms of sine and cosine. So expansion of a periodic function in terms of sines and cosines. In case if the function which you are going to expand is not periodic, then what do you do? Can we take an interval in which let us say? So that's the portion which is the starting point of this transform. So the Fourier series has its natural extension in terms of Fourier transformation or Fourier transform, where in case if we do not have a periodic function, or even if it is a periodic function, it doesn't matter, but in case of a regular function, any function, regular one, we can still expand expand it and that's the idea which we are going to use here. So one dimensional, I'm just starting with this definition and we'll just uh, dissect it soon. So something like this or I can write down Fourier transform of Fx can be written as f bar k, which is equal to 1 over root 2 pi minus infinity to infinity dx e minus i k x f x. OK, what have I written on this screen? What I have written, if you look into it, that the series form, let's just look into the first one. The series form, what was there, is now replaced by an integral, integral over k's. So this series, if it was going in the countably infinite manner, let's say, so if it was going in the form of k is equal to 0 to infinity or minus infinity to infinity in the countable manner, this series, now this integral will go over this dk, which is of course the series form. However, now it's an integral way, which means that it will become. It will become uncountably infinite. So what does that mean? That means a general function, if you take whether periodic or aperiodic, can always be written in terms of minus infinity to infinity dk which is a real variable now so instead of saying that we will have infinite number of harmonics in terms of which countably infinite number of harmonics in terms of which we can expand it since the function can be non-periodic so we say that it will become 
uncountably infinite harmonics over which we can still expand the function. So it's basically in principle thinking about going from this countably infinite number of harmonics that you could have counted the number of harmonics and for each of the harmonic you are writing that expansion and you are just adding over those harmonics. Now you are saying that you are not adding over some countably infinite number of harmonics. You are doing some uncountable infinite. So that's the only difference which comes. So in terms of this integral over DK, OK, that's the first point. Now this e raised to power i k x is of course interesting because e raised to power i k x is what is called something what is called this kernel of it. I won't go into again the de detail of this guy, but if you look into it, I have defined this kernel as a function of x k. And these guys minus infinity to plus infinity, these guys are some sort of uh, integral limits a to b. In fact, the class of integral transforms are defined by defining these integral limits and the kernels. Once these kernels are defined, then you basically go ahead with the transform. So be it the Laplace transform, be it a uh, Fourier one or Henkel transform or any other transform. You will find out that it is one thing which changes, which is what we call as the kernel and then rest everything is almost same that we are trying to write down a general function in terms of some other one. And there the relation between X and K comes. For example, the one which I am writing that if I can write down my FX in terms of this F bar K, many a books of course write GK just to say that the functional form can be different. And then you have this inverse of that as well. So you can write down that inverse of this is nothing but look into the form 1 over root 2 pi. Now the integral is over dx. This kernel e i k x become e of minus i k x and the function f x goes from one to another. So the form of integral transforms are such that they are invertible. So one has to think about a transformation in terms of this invert invertible transform. So in some sense you can write down this f bar is equal to f of f and f is equal to so this is what we are calling as the integral transform which is defined here as the fourier transform fourier transform again in summary is nothing but the extension of fourier series which was done only for periodic functions here we can now go for uh, non periodic functions as well price to pay price is now you do not have finite uh, or a countable number of uh, harmonics you will have uncountable number of har harmonics and hence the series will go for the integral okay questions here you had this uh, fourier transform earlier also right i mean sometimes you must have read it is it yes yes sir yeah okay oh, okay so i'm just uh, extending that basically now question when a function will have this Fourier transform, can any function have Fourier transform? I said a non periodic function, or there are certain conditions. First condition, of course, will come pretty quickly. If it is an integral transform, then the integral has to. Exist. Square integrable. Not in this case in square integrable. I mean, just look at the form, right? I mean, look at the integral. You know that X is real. So in that case, of course, your E minus I K X or E I K X will always be equal to. This guy will always be equal to. Since X is real. This guy will always be one. So all you need to be, uh, ensure that this function should be integrable. Fx has to be integrable, which means that minus infinity to infinity, the limit has to exist. OK, and for that to happen anyway, Fx has to be. Is a 
piecewise continuous function. So it, it has to be integrable, remember? So it has to be at least piecewise continuous. This is how you will have an integrable function in the first place. Even if it is integrable, the limit minus infinity to infinity has to exist. Dx mod fx and the same condition will be there on dk f bar k. Now, one of the places where uh, integral transform is very useful, of course, is the time frequency domain. But the reason why I start with x and k in quantum mechanics, we have this wave function. Let's say now by this time, you know this is your ket psi. If I operate on the left hand side by this x, then we call this guy as psi of x. Great. And if I operate the same psi, projecting it onto momentum one, then? Psi of, P. psi of P. Psi of P, right. Now, of course, the form can be different. It is not necessarily that psi x has to be of the functional form same. But remembering that P is equal to H cross K, I could have written in terms of K psi as well, right? I mean, it does not need to be written as psi P, but psi K. So these two guys, the wave function form in position and wave function form in momentum space or the wave number space, whatever way you call it. How do we get the relation between the two? So this relation, of course, now comes naturally that let's say if I have a FK bar, which means that we have the functional form in K space or momentum space available to us. I can go to my space form of the function just by having a Fourier transform of it. So tr tr Fourier transform will allow me to go from K space to X space or X space to K space, depending on whether you are taking the inverse inversion or the direct form. Now, some important things to note here. I took one over root two pi in both of these. It's not mandatory to take one over square root two pi in both of it. In fact, you can take one over two pi in one and one in other, but you have to be consistent. You cannot change the definition every now and then. So we use this one. I mean, I use this one because this looks more symmetric. I do not need to worry about in which factor I'll have to put a square root two pi and in which of the factor I do not have to put two square root two pi. Then this exponential, this kernel, exponential i k x here I have written, and then I have written exponential minus i k x on the bottom one. It does not necessarily need to be. I could have written exponential minus i k x in the first one and then exponential i k x on the second one. So these are the freedom and this is the freedom which one enjoys while one writes the Fourier transform. The freedom which one enjoys has to be understood in the manner that once chosen, you cannot decide to change it every now and then. I mean, once you have taken for fx is equal to e raised to power i k x, then you cannot keep on changing to e raised to power minus i k x in rest of the problem and then coming back to e raised to power i k x. So freedom is there, but freedom once chosen, then it fixes the Fourier transform. So I have just shown that this is one of the ways of writing it. XP space is a common way of relating through the Fourier transform and hence I started with this example, but you could have taken this the same. For example, the time frequency domain. And this you might have already done in your electronics. So where I can write f of omega, for example, 1 over root 2 pi minus infinity to infinity. Again, I have this freedom of chosen, choosing this. So this guy and then this guy will be f of omega e minus i omega t and the integral will be over d omega. So this guy, of course, we also use a lot in electronics. Yeah. Uh, something else to note that integral transform in general, but Fourier transform surely. Fourier transform. Is a linear operation. What does that mean? Now, I mean, I started my lectures with this linearity and I continue with this linearity almost everywhere. 
So what does that mean? So if I have functions a f1 plus right b f2. So there are two functions f1 and f2 and a and b be any constants. Then what will be the Fourier transform of this since the operation is linear? A times the Fourier transform of F1 plus times Fourier transform of the second. Yeah, so please remember, I mean, this is uh, again, I emphasize that transforms the integral operator. We showed it took it as a linear operator when we were discussing trans transformation. So all these integral transforms, be it Laplace, be it Fourier, etc., they are all these linear uh, operators. So it just converts from one to another. Anyway, questions on to the definition. Sir, why does this one over root two pi uh, factor doesn't affect, sir? Uh, what doesn't affect in what sense? Sir, as you said that uh, we can take uh, uh, here one by two pi also. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yeah. I mean, okay. The factor doesn't affect. It is about see. Generally, the constants are absorbed. When we say that, it means. The constants are there whenever they are there in the transformation. Then this function, if you see uh, this function f bar t, could have been written in a manner in which I could have written 1 over 2 pi or 1 over square root 2 pi, or if I would not have written anything, just 1 here. Then also factors would have been absorbed in this f bar t. Only that means that the f bar t, which I would be writing or the Fourier transform, then that Fourier transform will have additional factors coming on. So those factors get absorbed. The point is that XK space, when we are doing in the XK space, it's, I mean, okay, you understand that quantum mechanics is where the XK space is coming, right? XP space. Whereas electronics is the place where TW is coming, time or frequency domain is coming. Now time frequency domain people, they generally like to have the symmetric uh, structure. Whereas XP guys, I mean, it is the position wave function, which is let's say more sacrosanct in some sense than the momentum wave function. And then uh, try to write something, a factor of one for one FX and try to write down factor of one over two pi and psi p. Historically, it is done like that. But then later on, it is understood that it is just about absorbing the constants in the function itself. It's just equivalent to saying that. So whenever you are starting with this Fourier transform, be clear that if some definition is given or not. If not, you can choose a definition which suits your uh, suits your let's say interest. It doesn't matter whether you choose one over one over two pi. I cannot make that wrong. If for example, I do not define my Fourier transform to begin with in the question, and then I ask you to find out the Fourier transform. Let's say you do not write one over root two pi, you write one over two pi. I cannot say that that is wrong. I won't deduct marks on the basis of that surely. Yeah, so that's the freedom which is there. Yeah, I mean, you understand that is what is happening. I said this, there exists this kernel KXT. I write that as E I K X over root two pi or I write this as E I K X over 2 pi or I write as E I K X. That is what uh, the change is uh, in terms of what we are writing, but it is a change only in terms of a constant and hence uh, it doesn't affect the transformation. Yeah, that's the reason. OK, let's do something quickly and then let me also check. Uh, Fx I wrote as 1 over root 2 pi minus infinity to infinity dk since it is x so I'm writing dk okay in the definition e i k x and then f bar k but if I this just expand this guy again in terms of fx then what will happen 1 over root 2 pi minus infinity to infinity dk e i k x and then I will write again 1 over root 2 pi minus infinity to infinity dx prime exponential. What should I write here? Exponential. Minus i k x. So minus minus i k x prime. Very good. F of x prime. So what will this guy become? 
वन ओवर टू पाए माइनस इंफिनिटी टू इंफिनिटी माइनस इंफिनिटी टू इंफिनिटी डी के डी एक्स प्राइम ओके दिस गाय इज सेविंग डी एक्स प्राइम देन ई आई के एक्स माइनस एक्स प्राइम टाइम्स एफ एक्स प्राइम या एंड देन वॉट आई कैन डू समथिंग एल्स सो इफ आई जस्ट डू दिस माइनस इंफिनिटी टू इंफिनिटी डी एक्स प्राइम देन आई राइट दिस वन ओवर टू पाए माइनस इंफिनिटी टू इंफिनिटी डी के ई आई के एक्स माइनस एक्स प्राइम then i write fx prime so i get a famous definition what is that definition set direct delta right so it's the okay it's the definition of delta of what it is integral over k so what will be this delta function So minus so x minus x prime. Right, x, x minus x prime. Whatever the argument which comes here, k is of course uh, integrated. So d x prime delta x minus x prime f x prime. What is it? This will be f x. F x. F x. F of x, which is basically coming from here, which is basically our definition original. But you look into the definition of the delta function, which comes naturally while one is putting this Fourier transform. That of course f x is same as f x. However, the definition of the delta function that comes naturally as part of it, or you can say vice versa that delta function was once implemented. This will give you this idea of the transform that how we are actually transforming. Now here you will also see that it doesn't matter whether I start with one here and then I will put one over two pi here, or I start with one over two pi here and then I start one here. In all the cases, the definition of the delta function will remain same. I mean, it is not going to change. So because you are multiplying your factors anyway, so this factor is multiplied by this factor. Yeah. So something which is very commonly asked. If I OK, by the way, if I have to write down this delta X, just look at the definition of delta X minus X prime. OK, I ask you to write down delta X, then how will you write? 1 over 2 pi. And then what? Integral minus infinity to infinity. E raised okay. to the power. Integral e over d. E raised to the power. Dx. D k. Okay. D. Uh, it cannot be. I mean, remember it is x yeah, here. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Great. Then. I k x. I k x. So I mean, you are basically putting x prime equal to zero. Right, identically equal to zero, and you get this definition of the delta function, uh, which is this. So, a famous question which comes, I mean, in general, that what is the Fourier transform of the delta function? Okay, uh, how will you get that? So that is, uh, I mean, basically, this is this. Sir, one over root two pi. Oh, you have done that. Anybody else? You put there. On the previous page, I mean, you are supposed to find out the Fourier transform of, yeah, Fourier transform of your delta function. So put delta of x here. What will this make? This will make delta of x here, and then what?
okay do that but the reason why i wanted to uh, do it is this is one of the reasons why you would be able to understand since you asked this question that whether you would like to put 1 over 2 pi to one factor and then make fourier transform of the delta function equal to 1 or whether you want fourier transform of the delta function to be just 1 over root 2 pi that will also tell you that what would be your choice? I mean, it is again, it is the choice which you take for this constant one over root two pi. I mean, this is different people come up with different choices, but this guy was the reason why delta x and delta k. I mean, you will figure out that in certain cases you will have one over two pi or one depending on what choice you are going to have. And people uh, like to uh, use just one here. Fine, I mean, this is the reason uh, since you asked this question. So this is the reason why uh, it is done. And that means that in the UGC net examination, if this question comes that uh, what is the Fourier transform of this uh, delta function? It's not easy in case if you find out all the uh, three choices there. So then you will have to do the representation at the end. You will say, Sir, this question could have these many answers and it's fine. I mean, there is nothing wrong with that. So your teacher has to be careful while framing a question on the Fourier transform. If the Fourier transform is not directly defined and if the factors are not getting multiplied inside, then one cannot directly say that whether the Fourier transform of 1 over square root 2 pi is right, 1 is right or 1 over 2 pi is right. That's uh, unfortunate, but that happens. I mean, I have seen it happening in the past. OK, questions up to now. OK, OK, so let's just do that. Because uh, we are into the applied portion, so I ask you to find out the Fourier transform of I mean I am writing my F bar T. If you look into it, it is just a way of writing my function. See F bar T. It, I could have written GT and that would have been uh, same. So if I have asked you to find out Fourier transform of this guy. Where? This is given to you as E minus alpha. Absolute T and alpha is greater than zero. So let's just find out the Fourier transform. So this guy will become this and as per the definition which I have used, I'm using one over square root two pi minus infinity to infinity DT E I omega t and then so this is what i'm asking you to do so basically it is supposed to be an integral which has to be solved how will you do that so we whenever divide it in two parts okay minus infinity to zero and zero to infinity and we Very open good. the mod so let's just do that so one over root two pi one is minus infinity to zero dt and what will be this integral in that case? So E i e omega t into e to the power alpha t. So plus alpha t, right? Yes, sir. And another half zero to infinity dt e i omega t. And then I should be writing minus alpha t. Plus alpha t. Right. Just do this integral and uh, tell me what comes. So this should be equal to 1 over root 2 pi. Then what? E i omega plus alpha t over i omega plus alpha. And this is minus infinity to 0. And then E minus alpha minus i omega t 
Or So what will be the result? Sir, alpha by me alpha square plus omega square. So one over root two pi times alpha, alpha divided by, by alpha, alpha square plus omega square. Okay. All of you agree? Yeah, by the way, I specifically wrote, I mean, let me just uh, say this one before I come to this guy. I specifically wrote uh, T in the manner in which if T goes to infinity, then this looks like minus exponential minus of infinity, which goes to zero. And in this case, when T becomes minus infinity, then this guy goes, goes to zero. And that is the reason why I wrote this as minus of alpha minus I omega T, just that, uh, nothing beyond that. Okay, uh, there should be one factor more, right? Sir, uh, it is 2 alpha. Right. It is just 2 alpha because when you have that, yes. you multiply it and then your uh, I omega factors will cancel and there will be 2 alphas. So alpha plus alpha, something like that. Yeah, but this is right. I mean, this is all which is, which is supposed to be done when we are finding out Fourier transforms. Of course, Fourier transforms are very useful in solving certain uh, differential equations as well, but we are restricting ourselves to figuring out the Fourier transforms mainly. Okay. So this question was easy and now let me just give you another question. That find out the Fourier transform of this function t where ft is given as let's say 2 alpha over root 2 pi 1 over alpha square plus t square with alpha greater than 0. Now, this is the reason why I'm doing this particular problem after having uh, done this complex analysis or complex integral. So first of all, first expression, what will be FW? This will become 2 alpha over 2 pi, right? Square root 2 pi here and square root 2 pi, which is there in the definition. So minus infinity to infinity. This will be integrated over dt e raised to power i omega t divided by alpha square plus t square. Yeah, and how will we solve integral like this? So we'll take it into the complex domain and uh, choose our contour. Uh, and, th and then we'll uh, again integrate like residue theorem by using residue theorem. Great. And that is the reason why I'm doing this complex, uh, this uh, Fourier transform here, so that you understand that in certain cases, uh, doing the integral is as simple as we did the previous one. And in other cases, doing the integral may require us to rely back on our calculus of residues. So let's try to do that. But before that, a question comes that what will you choose omega? Omega you will choose greater than zero. Omega you will choose less than zero or omega you will choose equal to zero. Because last time when we were doing it, I actually explicitly chose this k to be greater than zero. Yeah, I mean, go back and check my a2 and a3. You will see that a2 and a3 were of the form sine kx or cos kx, which were written in the form e i kx. And then I was saying k should be greater than zero. What will you do about this omega? So we can take it to be greater than zero. T is anyway uh, going from minus infinity to infinity. It will cover all the values. But what happens if I generally take uh, this guy? So one over root two pi minus infinity to infinity d omega e minus i omega t f omega, right? Which means that omega you will be taking from where to where. Sir, minus infinity to infinity. 
Yeah, that means that you will have to solve the integral for all these three separately and then write down your result depending on what omega value will come because when you are going to do this F bar T, if you were asked to, which is actually given here, then you would have to integrate over all possible omegas going from minus infinity to infinity. In fact, this uh, raises a very interesting question as well. Time domain going from minus infinity to infinity and frequency domain going from minus infinity to infinity. Does this make sense? I mean, frequencies can they become negative? So can you please repeat the question? Oh yeah, uh, frequency. What is the definition of frequency? So the number of oscillations made in one second. Good, great. Can it be negative then? Number in one second? No, sir. No, but then uh, the definition of Fourier transform has that. In fact, uh, time is also going from minus infinity to infinity and not from zero onwards. So does somebody know? I mean, have you used this Fourier transform in some electro electronics uh, problem? Yes, sir. We, we used in communication theory. Did you use Fourier yes, or uh, Laplace? Sir, Laplace. Sir, and we also used Fourier transform uh, also in communication Fourier. theory. That's a very interesting yeah. Uh, yeah. question. Yeah, I mean, it is used. It is used. Uh, please see that it is used. Both are used. Actually, Laplace is also used there and Fourier is also used there in the communication theory and in electronics theorems. I'm not going into the details of that because it's another interesting arena why we are doing that. But please see that this is something which is interesting that frequency is chosen to go from minus infinity to infinity and the time is also chosen to go from minus infinity to infinity. Hence, this problem has to be solved for all three. Omega greater than zero, omega less than zero, omega equal to zero. So let's just solve this problem by going into the complex plane and then OK, uh, getting the solution of this. OK, so let's start doing it. So first, let's do it for omega greater than zero. So first, omega greater than zero. C, E, I, omega. So T, I am ju just changing to Z. So T, of course, I'm taking it from the real plane to this complex plane. Z is square plus alpha is square so i will write z plus i alpha just z minus alpha it is basically writing the same thing yeah so how can i write in what kind of contour are you going to choose sir upper half hemisphere upper half so you'll have minus r to plus r and then you go from this to this and why did you take upper half Sir, we have omega in this case greater than zero and. Uh, Very good. C so R part B zero. Exactly. Great. So this portion on the time axis will become just this, which is nothing but T square plus alpha square plus then the C R part. E I omega Z D Z and Z square plus alpha square. So what are you going to use here? Do you need to explicitly show something or what will you use? So and Jordan R lemma in the second part and zero as R tends to infinity. So you were supposed to show that FZ is going to zero as R tends to infinity. That is all you had to show here in this case because by Jordan's lemma E I omega Z over times DZ will be taken care of by each other. Remember the exponential decrease versus the linear increase. So this is this portion will be taken care of by Jordan's lemma. OK, so this will go to zero as R tends to infinity. And what happens to this left hand side? How many singularities? What kind of singularities? Set two singularities. So okay. one singularity lies inside the contour. OK, which is I alpha. Great. And minus I alpha is outside the contour. So you are going to find out 2 pi I. And then residue 
at z is equal to i alpha for this fz, which is one over z square plus alpha square. So please do that. Give me the result. Say pi by alpha times e to the power minus alpha omega. Okay, minus okay, alpha Sir, omega. Last um, two pi I won't be there. Oh yeah, but this is the residue theorem I am applying. Two pi I times this, right? No. Sir, I okay, have so you, already took, uh, you already took care of this. Okay, sorry. So this means you are saying that this is two pi i and then this guy becomes e minus omega alpha and two i alpha will come in that. This is what you are saying, right? Yes, so yes, yes. Pi alpha. Absolutely right. Okay, that uh, makes sense. But what is f omega then in that case for greater than zero? Because there was another factor which was there, which was what? Alpha over pi factor which was there in front of this integral. So this will become what? Alpha over pi times pi over alpha e raised to power minus okay alpha omega. So let me write down like this. This is this guy. Yeah. So please do omega less than zero. T going to z and tell me just the contour and it will be taken care of. I'm sure. Lower half hemisphere. So you are going to take the lower half hemisphere. This means now you are going to go clockwise. This guy minus I alpha will be included. This I alpha will be outside. So please do this and give me the result. So right hand side, of course, you will again use your Jordan's lemma and it will become same minus infinity to infinity i over t. What about the left hand side residue theorem? It will be. Sir, minus two pi i times residue. Residue at z is equal to minus i alpha times f z. Great. So what will be the result of this guy? Sir, pi by alpha times e to the power alpha omega. Pi uh, alpha times e to power alpha omega. Yes, sir. And this is for yes, sir. omega goes to zero. Uh, yeah, so this result is for minus two pi. And what will be fw that means? So that will be e to the power alpha omega. That way, e to power alpha omega for omega going to zero. Okay, so great. What about third point, which is omega is equal to zero? How are you going to tackle that? So this will be f omega. You will have, of course, alpha over pi minus infinity to infinity dt over t square plus alpha square because e raised to power i omega t where omega is zero. So that will be just one, right? Yes, sir. So how will you solve this one? Do you need to do, go to complex plane? Can you solve it on its own? Sir, we can uh, take alpha as um, tan theta. So T as alpha tan theta. Okay, uh, take it. Otherwise, I can uh, simply ask you what is 1 over 1 plus T square? Integral of that from minus infinity to infinity. 1 over 1 plus T square. 
So one by alpha tan inverse six by alpha t by alpha. So in this case, yes, this will become one over alpha tan inverse t over alpha. Please look at the this integral. This is interesting. So it is just by one over ten t square plus alpha square. You just take alpha square out. You will become one over t square over alpha square plus one, and then you can just make a sim simple substitution, change of variables. In case if you want to, or otherwise you can even directly write down this thing if you can think of. Yeah. So this is same uh, famous tan inverse. What happens to the uh, tan inverse? So one over pi. Now tan inverse. Infinity minus 10 inverse minus infinity. Pi. 10 inverse infinity. Say pi by 2. Pi by 2. Pi by two. Plus pi. Yeah, I mean it has to be pi by 2 because it is sine over cos as cos has to go to 0. So this is pi by 2 minus what about this guy? Minus pi by minus 2. Minus pi by 2. This guy is minus pi by 2 and that means the result will be. 1. 1. Excellent. So what do you get in principle? You get F omega is equal to E minus alpha omega for omega greater than 0. E to power alpha omega for omega less than 0 and 1 for omega equal to 0. So can you convert this into something? A single expression? Sir, e to the power alpha mod omega. Right, uh, alpha mod omega, are you sure? It will take care of this guy. Close. Sir, minus, minus alpha. Minus alpha omega, absolutely right. So you see that you have managed to solve this problem using your calculus of residues. So several of the Fourier transforms, I mean, even though the integral transforms are useful, Fourier transform is useful, several of those get solved only when you invoke your calculus of residue. Because again, I mean, it is basically solving the structure like e raised to power i times something. And then you have to think how to do that. But by the way, I did not need to do this much of the calculation. Remember, I mean, this is what we got 1 over root 2 pi 2 alpha alpha square plus omega square. When we started with the function, which was 0 is to a minus alpha t, where alpha greater than 0. This is what we started with, right? And when I gave you the function here, f by t, then this was exactly 2 alpha over root 2 pi. I basically took from here. And then 1 over alpha square plus t square instead of omega, I just put t. So in one sense, you would have already got the result because you got. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I do not know what to say, but OK, this happens. This has happened. OK, so what I was trying to say that in some sense, you already had your result in front of you uh, and then you basically took care of it. 
But please understand one other interesting aspect of it. It's quite possible that when you are going to do the Fourier transform from one direction to another, you do not need any complex integration or the contour integration. Whereas if you are going to do it in the inverse direction, you may require that. So it's not that uh, it is not required in both the direction it is, and it is not required uh, exactly in both of these. But yes, I mean, at times your calculus of residues just help you doing more of this for your transforms or for uh, extending the reach again. That is what I have been saying. The complex integration. So questions up to this point. So we took care of two of the Fourier transform. What if I am going to do, for example, the Fourier transform of three dimensional quantity? Let's say R vector. In that case, this guy can be written as now look into it. One over two pi I used half. So since it's three dimensions, so you can think about it in three by two. Integral over K will also go in vector space. So some of you may like to write it like the K vector, others you will write the Q K. But remember that that means that it is an integral which is integral over these three. Yeah, then OK, it is the definition I and then what should we write? K and R both are vector. K dot R. K dot R, right, and then you have this F K vector. So extended into three dimension that uh, it's not it's a straightforward. Basically, it is just that we need to remember that the factor of two pi uh, will have three by two. So for each of these three integrals and then D cube R or D R vector, whatever you like E minus I K dot R. And then this is FR. Right, so if I ask, for example, what will be del vector of FR? So if I if you operate del of FR, what will happen? So when you are going to operate del operator, so this has to be over R. If I am going to have the del operator in K space, I will have to write del of K. So this is, of course, a general way of writing del. If I'm not writing anything, that means it is over R. So can somebody think about it? What is going to happen? This del operator is going to go, of course, inside. So Fourier trick will be there. And then what? This will not be operated on K. So both FK and D cube K, it is not going to operate on. So it is going to operate on what? Exponential Only of on exponential of IK. So if you operate del operator on exponential IK dot R, does somebody know what happens? It's a vector analysis. Del operator on exponential i k dot r. Sir, will it become r times e to the power e r times exponential? So that should becomes i times k times f r. That's it. So when you are operating del operator on exponential i k dot r, it becomes simply i k and please see that there is no dot here. It is just e i k. This this is a famous one. Uh, please go back, check your vector analysis notes. But this becomes this. However, however, I must tell you that this result del operator on fr again depending on whether i choose positive sign or negative sign this result will turn out to be different yeah this is minus ik versus plus ik so there one has to be careful what notation one is using however if i ask you to do this del square fr then what will this guy become sir minus k square fr so this will become minus k square fr. Will this sign minus this sign be dependent upon choosing this e plus i k or e minus i k? No, sir. No, sir. 
No. So you will see that in plenty of these UGC's examination, since this expression becomes independent of the definition and 1 over root 2 pi doesn't matter whether 1 or 1 over 2 pi because that is anyway absorbed in this original function. So this is asked in several of these uh, examinations. So uh, you will find out del is square is asked commonly, but not del because del is dependent on the definition, whereas del is square is independent of the definition. And this k square, of course, is the, this guy k square mode. Yeah, so uh, plenty of the identities like this, they, they are generally asked. For example, what happens if you have the Fourier transform, okay, of, instead of r if you have alpha times r. So even though we may or may not ask it in the examination, but these kind of questions come in the case of for in Fourier transformation. And the similar to questions come in the Laplace transformation and others as well, by the way. Okay, one thing which I wanted to actually say without deriving it, and this is basically the last thing which I wanted to do here, Have you heard of this Parseval identity or formula? Any one of those. I, it, it's not that you know it. it. Have you heard of this? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Yeah. This is pretty yes, important to know. Why this is pretty important to know? So this is the most general Parseval identity which I have written. The interesting form come if I have this gx is equal to fx. If I choose this gx also equal to fx, then what does it become? Minus infinity to infinity dx and then mod of fx square on the left. And what will happen here? dk and this will be? Mod of gx. Yeah. K. Right, I mean this since you are integrating over this guy. So this is GK. So the integral transform or the Fourier transform of G bar K will become F bar K, F bar K star, which means that this will become this. This is very important point or possible identity is one of the very useful application of the Fourier transform because it tells us that if the position wave function is normalizable. So think about Fx as xi x. So if the function is normalizable in this position space, then it means that the function is automatically normalizable in this k space or the momentum space. So normalization in x space automatically means normalization in k space or p space. Now, while we were doing our linear vector spaces, I mean the uh, starting point and towards the end classes, we were doing what we call as the function spaces. In the function spaces, we did take care of two uh, operators, x operator and uh, i d over d x operator. And I tried to show you that the normalization of i and d over d x has to be done through this tricky root of direct delta function. Now, even while we were doing it, one thing which was not clear, entirely clear, that even if we find that the function is normalizable here, will this function be normalizable in the momentum space or not? Because minus i d over dx was going in the momentum space, whereas x was going in the position space. So this Parseval identity is very important in terms of remembering that those those uh, coordinates which are related with or by a Fourier transform, if one of it is normalizable, then the correspondingly another one will also be normalizable. And hence one does not need to worry about the normalization in the K space and X space separately. This is something what we actually get from this uh, application of this uh, Fourier transform. And that's why I generally put a lot of emphasis on this identity that even though we are not going to derive it, but remembering this identity is pretty useful in rem remembering in quantum mechanics that I do not need to explicitly normalize my wave functions in position space as well as in momentum space. If it is normalizable in one, 
then it is normalizable in other guaranteed. OK, questions on what we have done. So if not, then I will conclude it here because OK, uh, there's no point serving too much. Uh, so remember that it is more about the application of what we have done, either the concepts or the applications which are important here. Uh, since it's an open book examination, so we might not be uh, not we might we should we will not be asking questions related with derivations. However, the concepts surely the concepts can be asked or the applications thus far uh, in most of the exams which we have taken. It's the application of those. Uh, I mean, either the residue theorem, the Lorentz series before that uh, the cauchy gorse theorem or the comp uh, Cauchy integral formula and just before that the cauchy Riemann con uh, conditions. That is the derivatives, etc. Or maybe the harmonic conjugate and the Laplacian of those. So those are the basic things which we have done in our complex analysis. Question uh, now, or we will start with new topic and the final topic in next for next 11 classes or 12 classes, whatever we get. Sir, can you please repeat this possible formula once again? Yeah, I mean, you look at this uh, formula which you have got. Yeah. So if you just think about yes. it, that fx, then what will be f bar k? This will be psi p, right, or psi k? Yes, sir. Yeah, which means that if you have already found that this function is normalizable or square integrable in your position space, will you need to explicitly check it now for the momentum space, now that your Parseval identity is there? No, sir. No, because your psi p or psi bar p is related with psi x by the Fourier transform. Since these two are related with each other by this Fourier transform, so you do not need to explicitly check the normalization in two spaces. Normalization in any one of the space is sufficient criteria for the normalization in another space. So those variables which are connected to each other by Fourier transform will always enjoy this property. So normalization in T space is normalization in omega space, something like that. Yeah. So in quantum mechanics, yes, it's an important Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good. Uh, OK, guys, yeah. Me, uh, yeah, go ahead. Ask question. So there was uh, one more uh, thing. Um, the function that you just explained in the last question that we were doing for omega uh, greater than, less than, and equal to yes, zero. Yes, yes, yes. The final function that we have got e to the power minus alpha mod omega that is just for the question that was asked or it was combined for all the three sections that we solved it for like for omega greater than zero omega less than zero and omega equal no, to I mean, zero. So this function if you are writing in this form e minus alpha mod omega this function will become what this will function will become e minus alpha omega for omega greater than zero right. Yes, this function sir. will you become like alpha omega for omega less than zero when omega will be less than zero. Yeah. And this but function sir, when omega is if omega is less than zero, we have omega to be in mod, right? So if we yes. put omega less than zero, the yes. um, negative sign it won't uh, affect the negative sign uh, that is before the alpha, right? No, I mean, see, uh, omega less than zero means that this omega, what we were using in the mod, will become minus of omega when you will be expanding, right? So this is how you open your mod, right? This will be E okay. minus alpha minus omega for omega less than zero. This, remember, I mean, this is the question which you guys did, and that is why I generally ask you to do this question before that. When you were using this E raised to power minus alpha mod T, yeah? Then when you are right. opening it in minus infinity to zero, you are opening it with mod t replaced by minus of t. This is the property of the mod function, right? Absolute functions. Yes. Sir. And that yes, is how sir. it becomes alpha. And when you are using it for t greater than zero, that is why you did it. In fact, a variant of the question may be in, in terms of t minus beta. And then you will have to think about how to divide this function in terms of whether zero or then in terms of some beta, something like that. 
but yes i mean this is the property of the absolute function which we have used and since you have already told me this guy so i assume that okay i mean somehow you understood that yes sir yes i just okay. had this little confusion Thank oh, it you. doesn't it doesn't matter. Okay, that's uh, where the classes come. Otherwise, everything is written in the text in the books. I mean, I can just advise you to go to books, right? I mean, this is the reason why teacher is there. Okay, good. So uh, remember that. But I raised a question, by the way, and that question you'll have to sort out by going back on your uh, original Fourier transform between frequency domain and the time domain. And why would you be doing frequency domain and time domain from minus infinity to infinity? That is the Fourier transform. If you know that I mean, frequency is just a number which has to be positive. Yeah, you'll have to think about that. Please go back, read it, and uh, if you get something, that's good. If you do not get something, and if you continue to think about this question, maybe you will revert back to me in my chat window that, sir, this is what I have understood. Is it correct or not? And then I will be able to explain you further. Fine, guys. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thanks.